damn, that's a great tune. I think that might be the coolest theme music ever. <laughs> if I do uh, say so yeah. myself. It's, uh, yeah, it's amazing. You can hear that kick drum. <laughs> like, okay, it's showtime. Um, Most importantly, it has some hand claps. <laughs> that's, that's all you need. Um, okay, so this is exciting because we have Joel Graves with us, and he is the composer of the What Difference Does It Make theme song. And this is uh, the What Difference Does It Make podcast. Yeah. Welcome to the hey. What Difference Does It Make podcast. Welcome, Joel. Thank you. It's good to be on here with you guys. You're welcome. Yeah. We're so happy to have you finally. Our schedule's aligned. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the reason. Thank you, pandemic, I guess. It's been beneficial for us in that way only. The reason it's been tough with Joel is because he's always on the road. Joel, besides creating our uh, wonderful theme song, played with uh, Everest, also with Early Marks many, many, many years ago. You just finished up, I think, was it earlier this year? Or last year, you finished up uh, with Modest Mouse playing? Yeah, the last, last several years I've been working as a stage manager in a guitar tech um, when not playing, which has been more often than not the last few years. So I've been working with Father John Misty and um, Guster, a few other bands uh, that I've been working with consistently, um, which has been a good way to stay involved in music and keep out on the road so as a stage manager what what is your responsibilities there it's kind of you know it, it depends a little bit with each artist but the main part of, of the stage manager's job is really making sure that the show goes on as it's supposed to people are getting on and off stage at the correct times and uh, the gear is up there and, and working when it's supposed to be and uh, it's everything from when you enter the building to when you leave so it's fairly involved that's great so your job basically is to not get noticed <laughs> i mean I'm honestly I, that's kind of my goal yeah when <laughs> things are going well um yeah you you won't see too much of me I, I try to blend into the shadows as much as possible uh when when doing that aspect uh when i'm playing in a band you probably see me dance more than i normally <laughs> dance <laughs> so it's quite a different experience so i've been doing both for quite a long time uh, working and teching with my own bands and tour managing and all that stuff for years and years are you playing right now um we've been working on a kind of in absentia working <laughs> on a uh, post record actually oh. uh, it's been being passed around via dropbox uh, the last couple of months so when you when you say we who is who's uh is this a new band is this uh <laughs> No, it's it's Everest. Um, oh, really? Band that I was a founding member of starting in 2007 or something like that. And we've kind of been on hiatus since I think uh, August 2012. Really? That's, so, that's what Wikipedia tells me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's fairly accurate. So uh, yeah, we're we're kind of getting together and working on stuff through the uh, cloud space up above us all. I'm always curious as to, you know, when bands go on a hiatus, usually know that's that's the end of that. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Did someone reach out to uh, to you? Or Fortunately, we're all friends. Um, several of us have been working together uh, in the Father John Misty camp the last mm. few years. Yeah. Eli, our bass player, and Dan, our drummer, um, are both in the Father John Misty band. And uh, I was teching for and stage managing for that band and also ended up uh, substituting for one of the band members for six months uh, a little while back. So it was, we were all kind of getting a chance to you know, keep that musical uh, language happening. And uh, Russell moved to Nashville with his wife, Chandra Watson from the Watson Twins, great artists. And um, they moved to Nashville from LA, which we were all sort of LA based before. Mm -hmm. So I think the hiatus initially started with us kind of all starting to take some different paths and take some time away from the band. But we've all remained friends through the years and have a great deal of respect and care for each other and the brotherhood that we've literally forged through years of being in a van, in a Sprinter van and a tour bus driving around this country. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of just naturally picking up where it left off in a strange way, It's except we're not in a room doing it together, which is definitely an odd thing. Challenging. It's a very yeah. collaborative sort of process of us, like bouncing ideas off mm -hmm. each other. So it's evolving yeah. as things do. You mentioned that you are 
you're not in LA, you are in New Orleans right yeah. now. Is this, yeah. what brings you to New Orleans? Uh, so love, <laughs> the, <laughs> the short answer. <laughs> with, with the city or a person? <laughs> with, a, with, with a person, uh, but I've always loved the city here. It's fantastically culturally rich place. Um, the roots of both the blues and, and jazz are from this area of the world. Mm. Um, important aspects of, of uh, America's musical language. So um, it's always been a place that I've, I've been drawn to just for the voodoo of it all, really. Um, there is some mojo here that's uh, yeah. it's unlike anywhere else in the world. It's got the old country feel, but it's also very diverse. There's a rhythm here that's, that's different than any other place that I've been. Traveled a lot through the years, and that's been a big part of my job and my life the last 20 plus years is being on the road. But being here after spending most of my childhood uh, growing up in Southern California, listening to KROQ, <laughs> um, it's been a, a nice change to, to come into a culturally entirely different musical atmosphere. Uh, I've been playing with local musicians here and getting a little mm. feel for, for music and, and always learning. That is a huge cultural difference, Southern California to New Orleans. And, and you're right. I always felt like even yeah. from the moment you fly into New Orleans, you feel like you're flying into, I mean, the experience is different than anywhere else in the country, it seems. And I get it. Yeah. The music, we get it. It's and now there's a weight and a richness in the air, thanks to summer starting to take hold. Mm. So, <laughs> the heat and the humidity yeah. is... Uh, something else I'm, I'm missing the pacific ocean a little bit i'm actually making yeah. so you said something earlier you said you're in different studios around the country that brings me to my my next question your yeah. studio i own a rec recording studio uh, with my partner robert capadona and greg cortez in los angeles it's in the van nuys neighborhood it's uh, near where the 405 and the 101 cross <laughs> we've owned the place uh for i think 16 years something like that at this point it's a studio that has been a recording studios as we've been told since the early to mid 80s where initially i believe it was a commercial jazz room mm -hmm. elliot smith who is an artist that i adore took over the place for the final i think about three or so years of his life um so after he passed away a uh, good friend of mine, a uh, writer named Karen Rose, a uh, music writer uh, in New York who now lives in Detroit, uh, sent me a message saying, hey, have, have you seen this? And it was basically uh, a call from Elliot's family looking for uh, a buyer for the studio that they had been looking for several months and were at a point where they were starting to consider piecing out the, all the equipment in the studio that mm -hmm most of which is vintage gear that Elliot had put together um, over those, over the many years of he was, he was a recording enthusiast, I think most of his career. So um, did a lot of home recording himself throughout the years. He had amassed this amazing collection of gear that was, that he had kind of begun to have housed at uh, what he was calling new monkey studio, <laughs> which he said was the new monkey on his back. So that's oh, his okay. Studio got its name, uh, which we've, we've kept the name. We've tried to keep all of his gear up and running and supplement it uh, whenever possible and uh, keep it as up with the times as we can. Um, I had worked at Sound City Studios, uh, also in Van Nuys. Um, right after I'd gotten out of college, I got a runner sort of internship, learning how to be an assistant engineer job there that I held on to for a couple of years while I also started interning at a record label and management company in LA. So I was just keeping busy and had always been really interested in the studio process and eventually started playing with a band, a 90s band on Universal called Dig. And <laughs> uh, while they were recording at Sound City, they kind of got me to play on one tune and then ended up getting me to uh, come out and tour on the road with them. And I was like 21, 20, 21, something like that. And that was my first real introduction into touring life. And all this stuff was just sort of 
intertwined in a weird way. So when the, the possibility came up to buy uh, Elliot's space and a bunch of his gear, um, I called my good friend Robert Capadona, who I had met at uh, a small independent record label called Vapor Records in Santa Monica. And I was working as his intern initially, and then we became good friends. And uh, eventually uh, we decided to buy the studio shortly after Elliot had passed. I guess it was maybe nine months or something like that after he had passed. Um, his family was looking to try to, I think, create some funds to pay off some debts and take care of things with his estate. And they made the decision not to, to hang on to the studio. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went for it. Long story long. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for that, uh, we been all but shut down so we're kind of weighing our options right now and trying to figure out how to keep going uh, we made a limited run of new monkey studio hats we sold <laughs> um, which has been fun for us you know we just kind of were like well we we can't really get groups and sessions and people in there because it's basically we're kind of a petri dish it's it's a small several rooms that make up the studios control room, a tracking room, an isolation room, a couple other small rooms that we use for isolation, including a small lobby and a couple outdoor sort of hang spaces. But ultimately, they're not huge rooms. So if you've got somebody who's in there singing, aspirating heavily, anything like that, it's just not really possible for us to control kind of viral load within our space. So we've been very careful about how we reopen things and with great respect for our clients. We're just kind of taking a measured approach, trying to figure out how we can get this going. And the other hand, we have a staff of brilliant young engineers who work there a lot. And we'd like the studio to go back to being able to be their food truck where they can go in and work how they want to work and meet how they you know, want to work and be able to bring small clients in and small bands and foster their careers and stuff like that. So it's been a very eye-opening and challenging social experiment, business experiment for us. We'll put up some links to get some hats. Yeah, I was going to say, send us the link for the hats. Exactly. <laughs> we, I think uh, we made about 100 hats and we're down to less than 20 left. It's an original design that Ariana Murray, uh, who's the incredible artist, pianist, singer, bass player from Early Heart, uh, made for Robert and I when we first got the studio. So it's our original logo from 2004. All right, so we're having some fun talking with Joel Graves, the composer of the What Difference Does It Make podcast. We are going to get into more of uh, what keeps Joel busy right after the break. Welcome back to the What Difference Does It Make podcast and our chat with Joel Graves. Why don't we start at the beginning because you, you said you grew up in LA. Yep. What was the, um, well, actually our first question we usually ask everyone <laughs> is first album, first, uh, first concert, song, did you buy a 45, did you buy an LP? What, with your own money, what was, what did you lay down and get? Yeah, um, I think the first album I got was um, Beastie Boys Licensed to Ill. Good choice. Uh, and at, I think the first one I bought was probably U2 Rattle and Hum. Um, I'm not totally sure about that. Yeah. I mean, and so I was born in 75. So throughout the 80s, I was going from five, you know, around five to 15 years yeah. old. So yeah. it's definitely a very form, uh, formative time in my life. Uh, my brother and I grew up DJing records hmm. and basically with a microphone spinning records <laughs> and then sort of announcing the songs or back announcing songs or whatever on the cassette deck and recording it. And we would basically try to do our <laughs> version of what we were hearing on K-Rock at the time in Los Angeles, which was uh, such a different animal. It was, <laughs> it was still a bastion of independent and alternative music in a very true sense when I was growing up. So I think my brother and I were listening to that stuff and we would put on my dad's 
Sergeant Peppers or whatever and basically announce the songs <laughs> on it as as we were listening. It was pretty fun stuff. We still have some of those tapes actually. And at the same time I was listening to K Rock, uh, you know, all the classic Richard Blade, Jeb Fish, uh, Rodney, uh, Native Wayne. I grew up listening to all that stuff. Um, my first concert is a very solid 80s, uh, sort of a late 80s offering <laughs> that I went to with my brother, who was 15 months older than me uh, during high school. He took me to see, um, it's right at the end of the 80s, but I went to see uh, New Order, PIL, and the Sugar Cubes oh. at Irvine Meadows. So that was a pretty solid the 80s. At that time, K-Rock was, you know, uh, New Order was huge. Depeche Mode was selling out Dodger Stadium. <laughs> um, the Cure, um, The Smiths, all that stuff were the sort of the things that were really popular at that time. So my first show, I got to see uh, New Order, who was always one of my favorite bands because they mixed like kind of melodic bass lines, yeah. and acoustic guitars and keyboards and all that stuff kind of with really melodic songs but also like fancy sort of stuff so and interesting dark lyrics that were totally yep. fascinating to me at that age um so i got to see new order at that show pil of course with uh john lyden doing his thing and uh sugar cubes with a young very young bjork there <laughs> um which I completely remember asking my brother who that singer was and how she would make <laughs> sounds, which were completely unique and uh, a totally different musical lexicon than I was familiar yeah. with. So that was my first show. And then I think my second show was probably Social Distortion at the place that is now Chain Reaction. Yeah, so I that kind of like where I grew up in Orange County for a lot of those years. I went to Fountain Valley High School right next to Huntington Beach. So also that whole Southern California punk rock, uh, mm-hmm. Social D, um, a lot of the a lot of the bands in uh, Huntington Beach were more like the skinhead sort of vibe. Yeah, which I wasn't into or didn't understand. I think I was a little too young to get involved in that mix. I was still seeing the circle pits and stuff going on and gotten to a few uh, when I was in my teens and stuff like that. But I think I kind of stayed away from some of the dark, violent side of punk rock stuff that was happening. (laughs) And I was really into the melodic tunes of, the Cure and the Order and the Smiths and stuff like that. And, the, and my friends were too, which I think is a good, uh, that's probably like the thumbprint of K-Rock at that time. Yeah. Uh, I assume by your choices that you probably, you start playing keyboards first before guitar or what? Not really, actually. I mean, I did take some piano lessons as a kid that was uh, at my mom's behest. And I wasn't, you know, when your parents try to get you to do something, you're <laughs> just really not that into it and I don't think I was really that open and interesting interested in music at that time but later that did come into play I ended up playing keyboards and being very comfortable even to this day jumping on keys if there's parts that need to be played and I did that in early Mart and Everest and also in Father John Misty so yeah the keyboard stuff I, I think a lot of what I took out of that music at that time was great hooks um, there was always really cool keyboard lines and parts that would come in and out of those tunes. And I think before I got into the more alternative side of stuff, I was into the pop hits like Duran Duran, huge in the early 80s, you know, the reflex. I remember wanting to just listen to that song over and over and over again. It's funny, I have a much different view of the 80s now, looking back on it, and what that music means to me now is a lot different because I think during the 90s I started getting into the underground aspect of 80s music and that stuff became really influential to me Minor Threat Mm -hmm. uh, Fugazi Mm -hmm. from the DC scene Black Flag and the SST bands that were coming up from Southern California Mm -hmm. Sonic Youth um, that strong undercurrent of 
kind of anti-wave, anti-mainstream yeah. stuff that was happening in the 80s became what I really got into in the 90s. So I think a lot of the pop stuff for me was kind of maybe a little bit lost on me. It would seem then that when Nirvana came around, you were just like, this This is the perfect, it was like the perfect storm, I would imagine, when you first heard that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, and I was already becoming aware of some of the smaller labels like Sub Pop just mm -hmm. as Nirvana was starting to blow up. And I actually resisted Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that stuff pretty you greatly when those, you were all those records <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. those records came out and they got so hugely popular and famous that I kind of really resisted that stuff. And I was like, man, nah, I don't know. I ended up, uh, my brother wanted to go see Nirvana at Forum during the In Utero tour. And I was like, yeah, they used to play, you know, Raji's. They used to play little <laughs> clubs and I didn't want to go see him at the Forum. And that was kind of my attitude. I think I was, I definitely started going through more of my, uh, DIY punk rock mm -hmm. era. Yeah. It was absolutely influenced by all that stuff that was formed in the 80s um, by the, that do it yourself ethic that came out of New York, DC, yeah. and then LA absolutely played its role in that too. But they're not mutually, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can still be a fan of the poppier stuff, but into the you know absolutely at the end of the day i just love good melodies and good songs yeah. so i think it, i've learned to not be judgmental about things but yeah. at the same time that i was getting into music a lot of 80s records sounded like shit and late 80s it was, yeah. there were the yeah um, the, the records were heavily produced in a style that it now kind of defines the era as a production style the, the digital reverbs the noise gates and put on everything there's uh, so many things that certain synth sounds and that just <laughs> became a bit overcooked and i think i i definitely rebelled <laughs> against that stuff in a lot of yeah. ways too as i was listening to more organic things records started coming out in the 90s that were like you know we're not going to put a two second long reverb on the snare drum mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> things just sort of started to started to open up and change sonically and i was attracted and interested in that evolution as well so now when i go back and listen to some of my favorite records even some of those new order records technique was a big one for me melodically uh the, the theme song for the podcast was in my mind a slight tip of the hat to a new order a strummy new order acoustic song it was just kind of a subliminal reference to that but also um you know that stuff i think the the melodic nature of like whatever british wave that was happening during the 80s yeah like, we were so happy that someone so talented yeah. as yourself was able to uh to yes. kind of, uh encapsulate our our little podcast in uh, in 30 seconds <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I am definitely born in the 70s, but in a lot of ways a product of the 80s. So it's interesting how um, even just commercials during that time and <laughs> the way radio was and existed and the way, I mean, it heavily stylized all the, the looks, mm -hmm. um, the influence of pop culture, everything from Miami Vice to, you know. <laughs> Soul Train, you know, I mean, all that stuff was so influential and in transitioning from the disco era through the sort of punk undercurrent that was happening with bands that, like the Ramones who were still able to survive throughout the 80s and put out a bunch of like, <laughs> which were essentially like revved up 50s jams uh, that became pop hits uh, throughout the 80s and are classic still today. All that stuff, some my DNA. U2, every time we used to say, we used to yell Daily Dose anytime U2 came on the radio uh, in a, any sort of touring environment, tour van or whatever, because it was like U2 was just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. that stuff's pretty interesting. It's it seeped into who I am as a guitar player. I've never studied the edge. I've never learned the edge's parts, but those echoes and those sounds, you know, it's definitely a part of a lexicon that I dig into when I come up with an idea and I hear a song and I'm 
art comes into my head to go along with it. Uh, there's definitely a language that's influenced there. I also, um, I worked uh, for Elliot Roberts and Neil Young for almost 15 years and, and have become an important part of my, my musical understanding of on both the business side and uh, as an artist, how you can and should run your business. And uh, Neil's in like a classic, you know, looking at his catalog, like it's the eighties is a clearly yeah. defined era in his music where. Yeah, that's no that's question. I ask you about uh, what, you, what you think of Neil Young's eighties input. Cause that was, <laughs> when I was growing up, that's, you know, I always had heard about Neil Young and then he was putting out this weird stuff in the 80s. And yeah. like, I just dismissed him yeah. in that period. Of course, <laughs> back in the 90s, like in 89, like, oh, oh, this is, this is Neil Young. This is, this is some good stuff. <laughs> okay. And then you start going back and discovering him. Is that, how was, what's your Neil Young journey? You know, it's funny. I, I definitely uh, got into Neil during the early 90s as I was learning to love more, more and more music and learn that it wasn't about perfectly in pitch, in tune vocals or, you know, just kind of loving the ragged <laughs> feel of his music and the, the pure human emotion that comes mm-hmm. through with that. I, I had to go back and dig into his 80s stuff and Fortunately, when I first started buying records, his 80s records were dollar bin central. So you could go through and find React or, or any of those records that he put out that he ended up getting sued for making. He definitely <laughs> ended up stu- suing him for making records that, were, uh, that didn't sound like himself. And, you know, I think it's interesting that Neil, like everyone else, you know, was kind of intrigued by what was going on with 80s music. Uh, he fell in love with Devo and the punk rock movement he respected and learned from. And uh, he wasn't ready to be a dinosaur or to be considered a dinosaur. So he, he made a bunch of records that were pretty challenging during that time. But a bunch of those tunes, the songs themselves, really stand up. And he challenged his audience with singing through a vocoder and trying to change things up, playing a bunch of synthesizers and third guitars and um, his willingness to do that, I think, is something that I've always found inspiring and showed me that there are no bad eras in music. There might be the occasional artistic uh, nadir where it's like things. Just uh, elements that you don't strike you, elements that, you know, don't resonate with you. It's the, yeah, exactly, Holly, like stuff yeah. that you just don't connect with. Yeah. And um, I think kind of like what we're seeing right now with society that sometimes I remember being at all tomorrow's party show and Lydia lunch said something like it takes a lot of good fertilizer to grow a good garden. I remind myself that a lot and thinking about some of the eighties music that I detest. I think about what was happening. The other end of that spectrum, Sonic youth was being born and people were figuring out how to express themselves in new and different ways. And I found that other the reaction to that stuff really inspiring too. Did you ever get a chance to play with Neil? Uh, I have a few times. He was such a formative aspect of my young, early music discovery that um, getting to know him over the last 20 years or something like that has been something that it just sort of ended up happening fairly naturally. But initially I was scared shitless. I mean, <laughs> he's one of the most intimidating individuals when you meet him in person. He, he kind of carries the scowl uh, and <laughs> everyone around him kind of keeps, gives him space, you know, to do his thing. And rightfully so. We were playing at Everest. Uh, my old band um, was playing a show at Madison Square Garden. It was the second night at Madison Square Garden opening for, we were the first of three bands. It was us and then Wilco and then Neil Young. At the time, <laughs> if you asked me to create my dream lineup, it yeah. would be that. It would be exactly that. And for us to even make it onto that bill was an honor and exciting and uh, 
I just ended up kind of deciding to push my luck a little bit. Uh, the second night of Madison Square Garden, it was the end of our touring with Neil. We had done we had done a run in Europe, opening a bunch of shows for him and some festival shows, and um, he'd really sort of taken us under the wing and was under his wing in a way that he was giving us direct criticism, taking meetings with us after shows to to tell us how he felt like it was going as a spectator and stuff like that, which was just in, incredible for us as a young band to be able to, to take in that knowledge from him as well as from Elliot, his manager, who uh, I became very close with over the years. We, we had kind of gotten to the end of this run and I was like, all right, <laughs> last show, we got to do something. And uh, I ended up kind of just playing a couple cards the right way and uh, ended up convincing our band and Wilco that it was going to be okay for us to join Neil on stage <laughs> for Rockin' in the Free World, which was going to be the last song <laughs> of the tour. And um, we ended up getting up there with the blessing of several key crew members on Neil's side. Uh, including Tim Mulligan as front of house engineer, Elliot as manager, Tim Foster, his stage manager. A um, bunch of these people were very kind and helped uh, let this moment happen for us. And it ended up being this beautiful thing. All the bands came out. We did a big bow on stage. And uh, it was a very special moment for all of us and uh, definitely a triumph for our little band that could. And um, a couple months later, <laughs> lo and behold, Neil asked us to tour again. And it happened a couple more times where he would, he, he would a ask us to come out and support either him as a, uh, in one of his solo groups or with Crazy Horse. And uh, we got to go out and do it a few times. And after that moment, he knew that we could get up and and to add more vocals, uh, he from time to time started asking us to sing on certain songs. So um, we got to get out and sing on several occasions where we do backups with Neil, including one time here at Jazz Fest was one of the most memorable days of my life, of course. Um, we uh, got to get up and sing with Neil at Jazz Fest in front of... Uh, <laughs> that has to be the most fun. I mean, that's such a flattering for any music you know even for for i mean it's neil young <laughs> I, mean, I think we had such a love and respect for him and mm -hmm. uh his song craft and who and him as an artist his path that he's his very resolute path that he's chosen to follow uh has been a big inspiration for everest and i think everybody in the band knew that we had a lot that we still needed to learn <laughs> And going out and watching him, the way he set up for his show every night, the way he warmed up, prepared his body, his voice, whatever he needed to do to be able to, to do the shows every night was very inspiring for us. So we got to jump on that train for a little while and learn from that, which was just hugely important to learn from a legacy artist. Well, very good. Uh, we've taken up over an hour of your time. Uh, My pleasure. This, is, this has been so much fun. It's right. great to see you guys. And Holly, it's nice to get to talk to you. It was so nice to meet you finally. I never got a chance Amazing. to thank you personally yeah. for, for our Again, awesome was, theme. Why don't you give it My a, pleasure. That was recorded in 280 style on my cassette four track as well. Oh. <laughs> I just, I felt like that was in a way for me to get back to my roots uh, in recording. So that was done here in this room uh, in the Lower Garden District in New Orleans. I think we need to start publicizing that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of publicizing, if um, somebody wants to get one of those New Monkey Studio hats, how, do we, how does one do that? Uh, we have a website, newmonkeystudio.com, and it's studio singular, not plural. There's information about the studio, some pictures, um, some past history, some song, songs to check out that have been recorded there and stuff like that, as well as a little store. Um, I, I believe the hat's the only item in the store. So you can't miss it if anybody wants to support. I'm, I'm not wearing, I'm wearing my Make Youth Sonic. Again. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm wearing my new monkey hat all the time. Thanks again, Joel. I mean, this was, uh, was very nice. I'm glad, I think we've been talking for about a year now, trying to get you on 
yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. And, You're a busy guy. <laughs> and I love flaky as well, so it makes the same patient with me. <laughs> we didn't find you to be flaky. We knew it was, <laughs> was all good. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Joel. And uh, yeah, we're, we look forward to I'm I'm looking forward to hearing some Everest. That's going to be great. And, yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, it's coming down the pike, it sounds like. I think we're, uh, Eli is actually working on putting some uh, finishing mixes on, literal finishing touches on the mixes. So. All right. Well, pleasure as always, and uh, we will talk soon. All right. Thanks so much for Thank having you, me. Thank you, Joel. All right. See you later. Okay. Care, bye. See you. Okay. That was great. I love talking to Joel. That was so fun. That was really a pleasure. What an interesting, nice guy. For sure. Make sure uh, I'm going to, I'm actually going to pick up one of these new monkey studio hats. It sounds great. Me too. Um, I suggest you do it. Apparently there's only 20 left. So uh, get on it now. And speaking of getting on it, get on, on it now. How about signing up for our newsletter at, at our website, WDDIMpodcast.com. There's always fun stuff going on Facebook, WDDIM podcast. Instagram. Always good at the Instagramming. Um, also a reminder, reviews, five stars. Come on. <laughs> Just click on the five stars. You, you love what you heard? Five stars. <laughs> Do it now. So thank you very much. Till next week, this is Dave. This is Holly. See you later. Over and out.